really fresh material and, and indeed it's uh, as fresh as it can be so you can calculate yourself when those slides were produced and also the material itself is actually unpublished and new and I'll uh, point out where actually you know some of the work that I mentioned in the beginning is related to it so uh, let's let's look at this one so recall from the first time so we, we, we have an introduction you know basically on on Rhea and you know have resources events and agents and contracts in Tuition of those is basically specifying which sets of events or which sequences of events are good events, sequences, and, and which ones are bad sequences. And that's what we said was a, uh, intuitively what a uh, contract execution was. An important part of this one was um, resource transfers, which basically meant that we had to make sure that there were things that we could make sure were not duplicated or lost. And somebody who transfers a resource actually owns it before they transfer it. So uh, remember, so we have agents that could be representing anything, economic agents, um, persons, or automatic uh, um, agents. Events are significant real world events. So there could be business events. We will not talk much about them because the idea of a business event is, is that it will impact the state of knowledge, but it will not impact actually what transfers can be made later on of resources. So uh, another way of putting this one is like, uh, the resource effect of those is, is idempotent, so doing it once or multiple times. Um, um, and in, in our cases, it will be nil, so we'll have no resource effect. So the, we'll focus on resource events. That means there's producing, and again, those will be secondary. I won't go much into those. And transferring resources amongst the agents. Um, all right, so the resources are usually physical or digital goods and resources like these. And, um, and as I said, the, the, the main thing we want to accomplish is as, as a trustworthy way of not copying and duplicating. And the contract, as I mentioned before, a classifier of event sequences. OK. Now, so we'll talk about an algebraic model for transfers, uh, and first for resources, and then for resource types and for transfers. So for those of you who work with, uh, with uh, you know, this you know, in the blockchain domain, so this is, an auto, this is a theory that has automatically built in user-defined resource types. So you have your own resource types. They will be managed correctly in the sense not duplicated, not lost. And um, we'll, we'll do this by you know, using a little bit of, uh, in this case, actually, in the setting of vector spaces, co-products, and, and, and kernels. And, um, and that gives us a powerful algebra for operating on transfers, namely the vector space operations. So, as I mentioned, vector spaces, as I said, please, please remember your vector space hat. So for those of you, I just want to say, or think of vector spaces and linear maps as something having to do with you know, columns and square things called matrices. Put it out of your head, because the default discourse we have here is infinite dimensional vector spaces, OK? So it's better to think of them in this fashion now, OK? Which is, it turns out to be the same thing for finite dimensional vector spaces, but there's no reason to you know, limit the view of that. Um, so remember, vector space is, uh, we have a, a given field, and without loss of generality here, we'll assume the field that we're working with, which means it's the field of counting things, will be the reals, okay? All the reals, also negative ones, I'll come back to this. Um, so you can think of it as like, if you only have things that can be counted discreetly, like 14 iPhones, not 14.2. Think of the 14 as embedded in the reals, OK? So it's 14.0. Um, now, the reals themselves are a vector space um, of dimension one. Um, so they have the operations of, uh, well, adding two vectors of uh, the additive inverse. So it's a unary operation. So for every vector, there's an inverse of it such that if you put them together again, add them, there's zero. Then there's the zero vector. There's always a zero in there. And then we have scalar multiplication, which is where the, the field pops up, OK? OK. So what are some vector space constructions? Let's look at some of them, all right? And let's go through them slowly, even though maybe this is very old hat for some of you. But if you're like me, you either have never seen it like this or forgotten it. But you're young enough, you shouldn't be have, you know, I have an excuse for getting these things, so, but you're not old enough. So, uh, 
So let's look at this one. So if, and let's assume we have an index set of, of vector spaces, okay? So, you know, Vx for x is a big set, some set that, you know, somebody has given us. And for each element in there, we have a vector space. There could be different ones, okay? They might be equal for the same x, or there could be different ones. So once we have already such a set of vector spaces, we can construct the product vector space, which is basically the functions dependent functions, if you want, from any given x, they map, you know, it consists of the set of all functions that have the following property that, uh, you know, a given x is mapped to an element of the vector space V sub x, okay? So it'll fit right into the vector space that's designated for any function, okay? So the set of all of those functions is actually then a vector space. What's addition? of, you know, two of those functions. Just, pardon? Composition. Uh, composition, what sense? Yeah. Applying one. Uh, you're applying, but if I have two functions, so uh, you have two functions now, right? And we want to find out what's the addition of those two functions. <coughs> pointwise. Who said pointwise? <coughs> yes. Well, yeah, you're cheating. All right, now, that's uh, it's true, of course. It's pointwise. So, so basically, all the constructions here will always be almost the one that says, like, we have something like a function, and uh, if we have on the codomain a vector space, uh, which means on the codomain we have a plus, you know, and you have a scalar multiplication, we have all these operations, we can lift them. So any function on any set, so the, the domain does not need to be a vector space, just a set, okay? Yes. And I should have put on coffee. All right. Co-product is the same, but very important, the sec uh, so it's basically also just functions, but there's a big difference. <coughs> Namely, uh, you know, there are functions from x to vx, but they have finite support. So it's only those functions that have finite support. Finite support means that there's only a finite subset of the x's that is mapped to a non-zero element, okay? So you can think of those as finite maps. So it's still a function that is applicable to all the x's, but it's a finite map with a default value of zero. So if it's not in the support, uh, where you get a real value, in the, like a finite map gives you the real value, you, uh, you basically just say, oh, OK, in that case, it's not in the, so it's the default value of zero, OK? So what's the difference between, well, you can see these are two different sets, right, or two different vector spaces. How different are they if x is finite? So imagine now I give you an x because the whole thing is indexed by the capital X. So uh, they're the same, yes. So one of them basically shows you that it's a co-product, so you can inject uh, into it. Um, and the other one is a product that says you can project out of it. And usually the, the, the vector spaces we study in finite dimensional vector spaces, they're by, byproducts, which means that, uh, you know, the products there serve both, both as coproducts and as products. So they're, that's sometimes confusing because, but here you can see they're actually different. For infinite x, they will tell you that, no, 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 there is, you know, one of them can be embedded in the other one, coproducts and the product in a canonical fashion, but they're certainly different. Now, we also could construct the linear, vector, the linear map space. That's also a vector space. It's the space of all linear maps from one vector. Now we need a vector space to another vector space. And linear maps are the homomorphisms of, of, of vector spaces. They're basically the ones that distribute over plus and scalar multiplication. Okay, so, and I'll, you know, take a little break here so make put, uh, coffee on, which is a way of uh, yes. So, uh, so we'll uh, actually mostly be working with uh, these kinds of types later on. These are the co-products. They're homogeneous co-products. 
because the, uh, the vector space V that we'll have in there will not be different, will not depend on X. So it's always the same one. Great. So let's look at some examples of vector space constructions. So first of all, we have, uh, let's assume X is some set. Then we can, s the direct sum of two vector spaces, that's the coproduct where the index set is just one, two. Okay. So it's a very finite uh, vector space. Um, the free vector space is also a coproduct, but the vector space we have underneath it is the original field, K, that we're doing this for. Um, why is it called the free vector space? Because it basically builds, uh, for any given set, it builds a vector space that has that set as the basis. And, and then you can, every, every mapping from X to some kind of vector space can be mediated by going first into the free vector space and from there through a linear map to that one. Uh, so let's, uh, this is not accidental, these things are here. So, uh, so an example, a very important example of a linear map, remember linear maps, distributed over plus and scalar multiplication. That's just the one that says, let's assume we have a coproduct, a homogeneous coproduct over some vector space V. We can always formulate the sum of that. What does that mean? Remember. Um, the argument is a finite map. All the other ones are zero. It's a finite map. Then uh, the, the, the sum applied is the generalized sum, binary sum on, on the vector space. Namely, it says, well, just take the vectors v1 through vn and formulate the sum of, of those, okay? Easy enough. Now imagine now somebody gives us a, a, a function from the set x to the field K. You're very welcome to think of that as like, X is like uh, just a string. We'll get to this one. What kinds of strings we're interested in. And K is the real numbers. But think of the real numbers of, that's the real number in some currency. So think of it as like US dollars, okay? So this one says, an X costs this much money. So P gives us a price for every X, okay? Now we can extend the P to, a, to the free vector space, so to maps of these, um, you know, of, as, a, as a maps from, 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 from X to V by, by just saying, well, that's the uh, unique extension of P to free X, K, X, and uh, I should have defined it someplace. We'll see an example of that one. It's intuitively, what we'll see later on, okay? It's basically the one that says, oh, interpret every x that occurs in there as with, with the number, and then do the corresponding multiplications and additions. Now, uh, uh, this one's not important for us, but this one is very important. So the kernel of a linear map, every linear map has a kernel, is just all the vectors from the domain that map to zero under that function. So all the x's, such that if you apply f to it, give us zero. And the image is just, you know, all the, the, the range of f, okay? So, you know, all the, all the y's that uh, um, have some, uh, are in the, on, in, in the image of, that's what it says, in the image of f. Great. Let's look at examples of these examples. Okay, so, uh, in order to make it a little more concrete. So we've had the direct sum, what is that? That's a very noble term for something if the underlying field we start with or the underlying vector space is just the reals, then the direct sum of the reals with the reals, that's just, you know, uh, that's just the product of reals. So if you have two of them, that's just R square, okay? So five, eight, the pair five, eight is an element of that direct sum. The direct sum just means that I'm tupling. Um, you know, I'm just taking one and the other and I'm just tupling them together. Because think about it, what we usually think of as a vector, this is very confusing. As a vector, it's like, you know, V1 through Vn, we write it down like this. If you think about it, what we're really writing down is a map from the index set, which is 1 to n, well, to the corresponding values, right? So we have this convenient notation in the case where we have 1 to n as the index set of writing just the values down one next to the other. But it's still just a map if you think about it, okay? Now, if we look at uh, a, uh, 
an element of, of this product space. So I'm just taking two symbols, x1 and x2. I'm forming the two element set consisting of x1 and x2. And I'm asking, OK, let's look at the co-product of those two. It's basically the same as the direct, the direct sum. But, but now I'm just insisting that the indexes are called not 1 and 2, but you know, I'm giving a name, x1 and x2. Then you could say, well, they can say then, then you know, a vector has this general form. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, x1 is a basis, and x2 by itself is a basis. So every element of that vector space is a finite linear combination of basis vectors. So an example would be 5 times x1 plus 8 times x2. You can write it like this, and I'll write it some cobracts like I use that notation, or you can think of it as like it's a map, okay? As we said before, it's a map from the index set to the values, in this case to the elements of k, the real numbers. We have an element of a coproduct here with a particular vector space, so we can apply the corresponding sum linear map on it. What does the sum linear map do? Remember, it says, if we take a map, and it's maybe good to write it as a map here, it just basically ignores you know, the, the base vectors and just takes the corresponding elements and adds them together. So we get 13. If we look at now p star, now let's imagine how p is a price function that says an x1 costs 4. So we're mapping x1 to, to 4. And an x2 costs 3. Well, what is the cost then of a, uh, an element of this vector space? So it's the extension in the natural fashion. Got to think of it as like, you know, an x1. So maybe the notation up here would be easier, but uh, an, an element of x1 is mapped to 4. An element of x2 is mapped to uh, 3. And then we multiply them. So it's 4 times 5 times 3 times, five, uh, three times 8, OK? 44. OK, and then finally, you know, we could ask ourselves, what's the kernel of P star? That's a finite map. The kernel is, um, well, all the ones that, uh, you know, all the uh, maps, so it's an element of the domain, all the maps such that if you apply this pricing function to it, it comes out to 0. So if you do a little bit of thinking here, it just means that literally it means 4 times x1 plus 3 times x2 is equal to 0. So can somebody give me an example, an element of this? Vector space. Negative three and four, thank you, yes. It's what everybody thinks of because, you know, four times three and three times four works out well. So, uh, um, absolutely. So, uh, negatives occur in there, that's important. And then we can, uh, of the price function is all the real numbers. Uh, the only alternative would be is that it, it, they all get mapped to zero, so. All right, now we've seen examples of examples. Let's see examples. No, that's not. So um, let's get the, back to the topic now. Let's try to do a little bit of modeling of the concepts we've seen. So agents for now, as I mentioned before, will just have no additional structure on those, OK? Eventually, we'll need it. For now, what we'll need here only is that they are set. A set has equality, so a setoid if you want to, and that's it, OK? Um, so the resource types, we stipulate, well, we don't know anything about them either. We don't need to know anything about them, only that they're a set. Again, you know, compare them for equality if you want to. So uh, think of, you know, we'll use in examples A is a set, including Alice, Bob, Charlie, different, three different agents, and there's many more, of course. Then we have X, we have USD, and iPhone, and DKK, and all kinds of things. You can think of them just as strings for now, right? Just indicators of uh, just strings, OK? Of course, intent, intended to mean something in the sense like USD means dollars, and an iPhone means a certain kind of model of, of, of iPhone, OK? Uh, what is the, how do we model the resources now? The resources will model, as we saw before, actually by a coproduct. The coproduct being, well, you know, it's, it's the coproduct over x, the resource types of R. 
So it's, remember what that means? It means that uh, finite maps or finite sums over any kind of elements from x that are scaled up a number of times or down a negative number of times, okay? Um, so, for example, if you have a simpler resource, we'll just write it, that's 50 US dollars. In the simpler resource, I mean, in this case, it's, uh, you know, in the uh, ideal of, you know, it's just US dollars. It doesn't involve anything else, okay? Just, it's in the vector space generated by, the subspace generated by USD. Just US dollars. Now we can have also compound resources. Well, compound resources means that, well, you know, it's a sum of two uh, or, or more, um, you know, of these simpler resources, like 50 USD plus two iPhones. Uh, then we could also have a missing resource, and that's also treated as a resource. We'll say, well, there's many different ways of interpret this one. Uh, just an addition, what does it mean, the arrow with the one? Oh, this one, uh, okay, so it's my notation for linear map space I had it. Okay. Okay, so you, you might prefer HOM or L or or, you know, oh, this is the community where you use the lollipop, sorry. Um, I should have used the lollipop, okay. Um, so uh, there's many different ways of writing this one down. It's the linear map space, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so these are examples of, of, of resources, okay. Now, what are ownership states now? Ownership states, you've got to think of it as that's the key thing we'll basically manipulate. It's like... It says, who owns what? Okay. Who owns what? So, agent A owns this, and what do they own is a resource. And agent B owns that, that's a resource. And so on, and we'll have, without loss of, well, we'll have a finite number of those. So, it's an element of the co product over the agents of resources. Now remember, the resources already, are, they're not a field, right? So they're a, a real vector space. So, and now the transfers, this is the key thing you could say, that's actually coming from this book on accounting. They did this not for resources, but only for money here, which means for fields. But basically the idea is, look, you know, what's a, what's a transfer really? A transfer means that it's something, if I apply it, so an ownership state, it changes the ownership state, but the sum of it, of all the things that are owned, is not changed. So you'll quickly find out, actually, if we start with a given state, and we want to make sure that the sum doesn't change, the thing that is added to it, you know, as a vector, has to have sum zero. Then it doesn't change the sum we had originally. So then we'll say that's the kernel of... Uh, so it's the kernel. So the transfers, just to repeat, that's the subspace of the ownership states. You could say it's all the ownership states that if you add up all the things people own, they own nothing. Zero, okay? Okay, I see nodding, that's good. No questions, that's maybe not so good. Okay, so let's, let's look at it. You know, so we have an ownership state could be this one. So Alice has $50 and Bob has an iPhone and $10. Later on, we'll find out that they may be interested in dealing with each other. Uh, but that's basically the state of the world, you know, that somebody knows. We'll call this a resource manager, keeps track, track of, of that happening. Now, that resource manager might be a system you have in your mind, or a person, or a digital system, or a database system. But you got to think of it more olympically, okay? So it's, it could be nature, okay? So in particular, a very good system like this, which happens to be actually fully zero knowledge um, um, for, for transfers, is physical cash. So think about physical cash in the world. Um, there exists a way of thinking of it as, you know, I, I, if I have it on me, I'm controlling it. So there's a mapping from agents to people controlling, so in that sense, owning money, cash, you could say that system, that mapping, well, you know, mathematically, that's, that's an ownership state. Okay. If I hand somebody cash, right, then 
as long as it's not being forging that I'm involved in all these things, but that's the belief we have, then remember what's happening is like, it's a transfer. I'm, I, I, pr I have a proof that I have as much money as, as I'm handing off. And later on, you know, the other person has that money in their hands. But nobody else here knows anything about it, right? So, uh, but you can think of it as like cash being a resource manager in this setting. In this case, of only particular kinds of currencies we usually have on us, like US dollars or other cash, actually. Frankly, I'm from a country we don't have it anymore. So, um, but, but very often you can think of it as like, you know, it's, it's, you know, somebody, it's a database system, right? Or it's a system that keeps track of the mapping from agents to what they own. Yes? Yes, yes. So uh, the cost of transactions per se will be additional transfers, OK? So right now, I'm just saying, like, you know, how do we even make sure, how do we even model the fact, how do we represent the fact that we're transferring resources, OK? So the way we use it later on is, is in contracts, and, and there might be actually costs associated with, you know, uh, you know some, some other transfers because I have to pay you for doing something. Okay? But, uh, but right now, we're just trying to get a hold of the, the domain of transfers, OK? So and, and the, the simplest transfers, we, and these are literally, you could think of them as simple, because they, as a natural way, they, they form a basis of these, um, of this subspace, is, is two-party transfers. So that Alice, this is a two-party transfer. It always, looks, it always looks like this. There's two parties involved, and one of them has a negative of the other one, OK? Because in this case, it means that Alice is transferring, or this is a transfer of $30 from Alice to Bob. And it's represented by a map that says Alice is down minus 30, and Bob is up plus $30. The sum of it is zero. Now remember, actually, the zero in the vector space. So if, if Alice had given $30 and an, and an iPhone to Bob, well, the same thing. You know, Bob would then have plus $30 plus one iPhone, he would still get a sum of zero. And then you could also have compound or multi-party transfers. And uh, we'll, yeah, we'll need those. This uh, party transfer can describe both a transaction from Alice to Bob and a transaction from Bob to Alice, right? Yes, yes. So it, it, it can provide that. And it's multi-party in the sense that it can provide a distribution of funds Oh, this one. Uh, yes, so we don't know actually who transferred money in what order to them. Yes, so you could say that's the net effect of multiple two-party transfers. Okay, so in many different ways, okay. So you could say this, if you say that, yeah, let's assume this is a good, we only have sort of like as primitive, we only have simple transfers, okay. And we'll see actually transfers, you know, um, our vector space, so we can add them together, okay. Then we can say, OK, if we add them together, what do we get out of this one? Then we might get a, a, a multi-party transfer like this out of this one. There's many different ways of summing two-party you know, uh, two transfers together and get that one particular multi-party transfer. Okay. So if you're wondering whether this is useful in the real world, it's used all the time. It's when you, know, when you have some kind of a payment processor they will collect all the two-party uh, transfers, and they do exactly what we'll do later on. I'm not sure they're aware of that, but uh, they will just add them together in the vector space, compute a multi-party transfer, and then try and send it to a bank for settlement, which means like, please uh, subtract $30 from Alice's account, add $20 to Bob's account, and add $10 to Charlie's account, and the bank goes in and says, wait a minute, wait, wait. oh yeah, it's okay, the sum is zero, so it's okay, okay? It's a transfer. Um, so let's look at uh, a resource manager now. We can think of a, a resource manager as, um, as an object. So let's first talk about the separation I already had indicated last time of digital resource management consisting of preservation of balances plus constraints on which transfers are allowed. And let's just call that one credit limit policy. But actually, 
you can just think of it as a, as a, as a, as a term like blob because it stands for any predicate. And to be careful, because there might be some constructivists here. So I mean a, a Boolean function by that, OK? So a Boolean function um, on, uh, on ownership states that either says yes or no, OK? So true or false. So imagine somebody's given a resource manager. Now, resource manager is a, an object. It's a service. So you can send messages to it, and it will respond. Its internal state is an ownership state that satisfies the credit, credit limit policy P. So at any given point in time, that's an invariant. It says, look, you know, I ha this is the ownership state, and additionally, P of O ho holds, OK? It was the simplest version of it, of a resource manager, because resource policies you know, could change over time, but let's just assume they're constant for now, OK? So it's like the resource manager is born with two things, it turns out, like a policy plus a balance. But so the thing is, like, we have an, an ownership transfer, an ownership state, and it has a single method. That's important. It doesn't have other things. That's the thing that gives us trust that the, the resource manager does not duplicate or lose resources. It says, I, I, please apply a transfer. And then it uh, receives a transfer. It's an element of the vector space. Remember, transfer? And it says, OK, now, by induction, we already know the P of O holds, but we have to check with the P of O plus T holds. Now, this is the vector space plus, OK, on, on ownership states. So we'll just compute what the result of O plus T is and check, wait a minute, does this satisf satisfy P? As I said, up here, you uh, will very often have the case that uh, a policy is like of the form PA0C. So it means that uh, C is a mapping. It says it holds for an ownership state if for all A in this designated set A0. So A0 says, like, look, these are all the agents that have, uh, that have a credit limit. Okay? They, these are the ones that have a credit limit. Usually it's all of them. But as I mentioned last time already, you know, the central bank might not have one. Okay? So A0. For all those, we have a lower bound. And the lower bound says, I should have written greater or equal, sorry. Uh, the, the lower bound says that the ownership state is only legal if it's at least that amount. Now, this is in the case where we have a scalar here, right? But uh, you can imagine this being generally a you know, scalar because the ownership state is generally a vector. It's not clear there is any, any ordering defined on that one, OK? So if, if it's just the, the field here itself, just the reals, then you know, it's got to be bigger than that one. So the, the policy could be, is very often the one that says, like, whichever, um, you know, all the, um, all the, um, you know, the scalar, the scalars have to be greater or equal to zero, okay? In, in any kind of compound resource, somebody could, could it's, it has to be absolutely positive in that sense, okay? I'm not saying it has to be, but that's a typical example, okay? So then, uh, you know, the, the, the system is basically the resource manager does this. It says receive T, and this is the semantics of it. We'll see an indication of many different implementations of this. But uh, we'll update the internal state to O plus T and return success. Otherwise, do not update the internal state and uh, return failure. Now, last time I mentioned the job of a resource manager is exactly this, to validate and effect. So validate means return check that P holds and affect in atomic step that uh, you know, the update actually happens. Or you know, if it fails, say so it failed, but do not change the ownership state. Ownership state. So let's look at an example. Um, imagine the credit limit policy is the one that says nobody has credit. So which means that like everybody is, has to have at least zero of everything. Okay. Now, and we'll start, and this is only US dollars. Now, oh no, wait a minute, there's also iPhones involved. Okay. So, this is a resource manager as opposed to your standard bank that also keeps track of ownership of iPhones. Well, interesting, right? So, uh, uh, so the resource manager says, OK, this is the current ownership state. Alice, $50. Bob has an iPhone and $10. Now we have uh, a first transfer that comes in, um, namely minus $30 and uh, $30, which means like Alice is transferring $30 to, to Bob. 
Now, the next one is that Bob is transferring one iPhone to Alice. So we could execute it one after the other, but we could also do the following. Uh, we could say like, oh, wait a minute, somebody is submitting this not as a single transfer, but is doing this netting I said before. This says like, oh, I'll submit T1 plus T2 to the resource manager. And in that case, T1 plus T2 is, is this. We just add the two vectors together. You can see we get plus one iPhone minus $30. And of course, the dual one over here, okay? And then we check, um, is the cred limit policy of O1 plus the combined transfer, is it satisfied or not? It is. The result is yes, validation succeeds. We affected, and the final ownership state after this is that Alice has an iPhone, $20, and Bob has $40. Okay? Great. Um, Oh, we can, we can actually, yeah, sorry. Basically, uh, do you have to check uh, after each tra transfer that Ooh. the predicate is satisfied or only here? Oh, that's a very good question. And I'll have a question next slide, uh, an answer on the next slide. Thank you. So uh, I won't answer it right now, so, but I will answer it, okay? So uh, the theorem then, here says that, you know, it's a theorem. It's like basic property of, of, of vector spaces, namely if you take a linear function, you can decompose, decompose for any linear map, you can decompose in the kernel of the map and the image, image of the map, okay? So in particular, that means for us, now remember, we had a kernel, we had a function, the sigma one here. That means that if you take the image of f, the image of f is just r, I mean, everything can be reached, plus the kernel of it, and for that one we had a notation, right? So the sigma a r was just saying that's the kernel of the sum function as it goes from the co-product to just the resources, okay? So that means that uh, the, this is an isomorphism, so it's a linear isomorphism. This means like intuitively you can say like an ownership state can always be decomposed into two parts, namely a, a single balance, remember it's not it's not like you know, a mapping from you know, A to blah and B. So it's a single balance in the sense, a single resource. A single resource value here. Plus something that is an element of the, the co-product that sums to zero. So it's an element of, of, it's a transfer, okay? So intuitively this means that ownership state is always something that's like a single resource balance owned by one particular agent. So, you know, designate one. Let's call it the bank, um, B, and some transfer. Transfer, remember, is an element of, of that kernel of the sum function. So in the case where we had the ownership of, you know, let's say Alice has 30 US dollars, Bob has $40. Now we've added another agent called bank. And so that's the ownership state. But we can rec think of that when it's saying like, oh, with a focus on bank, we could say, okay, let's split the bank balance up into two parts, namely the one that's exactly the negative of the sum of the other one, that would be minus 70. In this, in this way, we definitely get a, a transfer out of this one. And then we just have to remember actually how to get up to the ownership of the bank. So it's the single um, account here that we have to keep track of. All right, so let's look at uh, some of the properties we'll get there, okay? So let's think about it this way. Um, transfers are an element of a vector space. And they're closed on a standard vector addition. Closed on a standard scaling, you know, scaling multiplication. Closed on, you know, take first of a vector, of a transfer. So in particular, you know, any multiset of transfers um, can be applied to an ownership state and will disregard for now the, 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 the credit limit policy <coughs> in any order, okay? I hope we'll agree on that one in any order, if, and now we have to say, all intermediate ownership states satisfy the credit policy P. Then it means that, uh, think about the resource manager, it took in these transfers one at a time, and if our credit limit policy is always true, then this is always true, namely it says, oh, it'll approve the first one, the next one, the third one, and whatever, and it'll get the same result in any order of these transfers. They fully commute with each other, okay? 
And furthermore, we have the following. It's like, maybe if we have a whole set, and they will play a major role. There are transactions in the end. If we have a whole set of these transfers, and we want to get them through an, a resource manager, well, we should say, like, Ooh, all things equal, we'd like them to succeed. So maybe there is an order. We can reshuffle them to, uh, to make them succeed, get through the resource policy. Okay. So for example, it would be if I have no credit limit, zero, and, uh, um, and I want to pay you $5, and you have to pay me also $5, but you have actually right now $10, you know, $7 on your account. That's important. Then we can succeed, because then you have to give me the money first, and then I can pay you. The other order won't work because the resource manager will say, well, you have no money. I can't pay you the $5 first. But there is an optimal strategy of doing this one for a set of, uh, for any, and that works for any kind of credit policy, for trivial reasons if you think about it. Now, the effect of all these, a multi-set of transfers, they get added to the ownership state. It's just by rebracketing, we'll see that's just the sum of all the transfers. So we could say, like, let's first formulate a single transfer, because they're closed under addition. And we'll get a multi-way transfer out of this one, usually. Let's form a single uh, transfer out of this one, and submit, instead of all of them one at a time, that one transfer to the resource manager. Then we have the following property, namely, if there is some valid order of applying M that satisfies the given P, then applying the single transfer is also valid. It will also succeed. The converse is not true. So it's entirely possible that we have a set of, well, a multi-set of these transfers, and there's no single order. We can get it into the resource um, manager. But if we're clever enough, we first do netting amongst each other and basically just take the sum of it and submit that one, and it might succeed. A simple example is you and I have no credit limit and no money. Now, we happen to have to settle the following things. Namely, you give me $5, and the other transfer is in the other direction, $5. None, no order will get this through, right? But if you now net settle it, take the sum of those two, we get a zero vector. Okay, Zero vector, that's a, that's a transfer. We can submit it if we want to, to, to the bank, to the resource manager, and the resource manager will actually, by definition, accept it. Okay, so all of a sudden, by this kind of netting, we can get more uh, you know, uh, credit policies to be, uh, uh, transfers to get through. But yeah. you're losing the information that we need to do. Well, if we're losing information, if you happen to throw away how you computed the net. Okay. So in other words, if you could say, I could maintain the M and say, T equals, I'm submitting T equals, I'm submitting this, okay, to the resource manager. Then it basically it says, I'm only checking T, but I can keep the provenance of how the T came by actually just keeping track of, of, of you know, the, the, the syntax tree of, uh, of the sigma, okay. You, you could do that. For privacy reasons, sometimes I'd say, why do that? Because the resource managers, Function is only depending on the result of a transfer, not on actually in which way, in this case on the T, not in which way actually they were computed. But yeah, you can do that if you want to. So the internal state can be stored as a pair, balance and a transfer. We've seen this before, right? So remember, balance and a transfer. Okay, the internal state was an ownership. We can kind of split it up into two. Uh, now the key thing, if you think about it, if a resource manager so like gets launched, you know, think of it as like an object, you make a new, new object, then it comes born with a, with, a, with a resource. That's the balance. Now the only operations we have on a, on a resource manager is sending transfers in. They never change the, the balance. So the balance is always the same. So if you think about this, this means that, uh, well, the balance component is always it's the same, it's invariant. It's always the same. So we might as well just, without loss of general, set it to zero, right? So we'll come to this. Um, balance resource managers. They're ones that say, 
if there is a balance that I keep track of, let me keep track of it somewhere else. Okay. I'm only keeping track of, I'm a resource manager, I'm only keeping track of the transfers. So I'll start with a zero balance, which means that's a, that's a transfer. And then I'll just, you know, maintain a, uh, the internal state is always the ownership, the ownership type is always the ownership state is always a transfer. Um, so let's look at an example, okay. So imagine now you have two resource managers. They're keeping track, think of it as like as banks or of land registries or maybe iPhone registries, you know, why, why not? When we combined iPhone and US dollar registries, um, and there's multiple of them, okay. So, uh, so in the first one, let's assume the internal state at this point is 01. So it says that uh, bank one, so that's the, in, think of it as that's the internal account, okay. That's the extra account we always have. So is uh, 60 US dollars, Alice has 30 US dollars and Bob has 40 US dollars. Remember, we could decompose it into a transfer where the bank now has minus 70 US dollars. It's a way of saying like, they start with zero and they're the ones that doled out all the money. They gave 30 to, uh, to Alice and 40 to Bob, so of course they are down in the red, $70, okay. So that's minus $70. Just make sure because the sum, you know, that one gives a zero then, you know, it's minus 30, 40, zero US dollars. But, you know, to make sure we keep track of the balance that the bank really has then, after taking into account that they doled out money, I mean doled out, I mean transferred money, uh, is 130 US dollars, okay? So in this case, we split this up as before into an ownership part, a single balance, and a transfer. So in, uh, in the case here, we have O2, it might be another resource manager corresponding to bank two. We do the same thing. So uh, m minus 300 because that's the sum of what Alice and Bob have in there. And then, you know, we have 310 in, in that state. So we can replace this by three resource managers maintaining transfers only. So they're all of them now only maintaining transfers. They have zero balance. Okay, so uh, it says, well, let's take this part and that part, the 310 and the 130, let's pull them out and have them maintained somewhere else. Let's invent this manager T0 that has the 130 from And then just to make it all work, we have a single account, namely that one that says, um, well, you know, to make it a transfer, basically just add an extra component, an extra agent, bank zero, and then make sure that this is well defined. I mean, minus 140 is what it requires, okay. So bank zero was not in there, okay. So this is like, you know, the one that's collecting all the resources up in this fashion. And uh, so that's another agent. And in fact, actually, this is, this is actually how things work. So this is, you know, something called the central bank, okay. So, and uh, the central bank is a resource manager that uh, prints money. It says, oh, you know, I have money and have maybe no credit limits. Oh, but not no credit limit in, in the formal sense. In practice, they're all worried about uh, all kinds of things having to do with, you know, how much money to print and not, and what, what you have in securities and all these things. But there's no a priori zero limit or something like this. And uh, in the banks here, the bank one and bank two, this is actually the reserves they have at the central bank. And the banks themselves then only maintain a transfer, uh, meaning that they always own, uh, owe mostly, they owe something to the others. So these are then IOUs uh, issued by the bank. So this is $70 that have been issued by bank one. Uh, and these are $300 that have been issued by uh, bank two. And uh, if one of them goes bankrupt and you own, you're one of the owners here, well, they're in the out of luck, okay. Oh, not in this case, because luckily they have reserves uh, that cover that, okay, because the, the bank O2 actually has reserves of 310, so they can cover all the potential losses from, from a resource manager, in this case, a bank going bankrupt. But, so let's look at this one like this, zero balance managers. So, uh, now, um, before we take a break, 
here is the exciting part. Namely, this has something to do with double entry bookkeeping, OK? Um, well, exciting in that sense. So a fundamental principle of double entry bookkeeping is, is the following. It says that all, this, all the accounts are scalar, really. So they're scalar accounts. And an account, think of an account name. That, that's corresponding to an agent here, OK? Account name, like, you know, expenses, travel expenses. Think of it as an, you know, an, an agent. And then what's associated with that, the ownership state with that one, that's just the amount of money that's in, the, in that account, the balance of it. Now, all scalar account balances, they sum to zero. That's a principle of double entry bookkeeping. Okay, so that's the reason we have terrible ways of actually you know, writing these T diagrams, because accountants apparently do not like um, negative numbers. Okay, so they write the negative numbers as positive numbers in one column, and, and uh, the positive numbers in in the other column, OK, as positive numbers. But otherwise, it's just what it means. Namely, you have both positive and negative numbers that sum to 0. So in every transaction, then, this is actually a corollary of this one, then every transaction, then you, when you book something, that could be a number of additions to your accounts. So by additions, I mean you're, you, you're setting something up and you're set, 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 setting something down. Again, that's a mapping from account names to values, and they sum to 0. They have to sum to zero because we have to have this invariance satisfied. And now uh, an account called equity plays the role of the bank that they had before. That's the one that makes what we really own. That's just you know all the accounts, and they could be non-zero. We just put it as a negative into a special account called equity. In this fashion, we get something that adds to zero again. Okay. We'll generalize this after a break. Let's take a seven minute break, is that okay? Three or five or so? Okay. We mentioned uh, double entry bookkeeping. So what we're doing now is resource accounting is just a generalization of this one. But remember, there's a couple of interesting generalizations. I have to turn on the sound. And hopefully it's on now. Yes. So uh, resource accounting, it's basically double entry bookkeeping, but generalized to admit Arbitrary resources, not just numbers in some kind of currency. And you saw the resources were a vector space that you could also add and multiply with. Um, then you have an expressive algebra. I mean, you could add you know, for transfers. So transfers are not something where you say, oh, let's add some money to one account and, and remember to subtract from another account. There's an algebra that says, like, if you start with something that is a simple transfer, you can add them together and scale them and take the inverse of them, and they're all transfers. They're closed under these operations. So there's a powerful set of operations. All of them guarantee that the, 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 the balance of uh, the ownership is not changed. Um, so in, and you will be surprised, maybe not surprised, that possibly incorrecting adding, subtracting to from account balances is not only a standard error that you make in your first year object-oriented programming course where you have to implement a bank account, OK, because you forgot to have a transactional phrase, you know, and then you do it concurrently and find out that you know, the addition actually once sometimes goes through, but the deletion from the other account does not. So you have to make sure it's a transactional transfer, right? Uh, that actually also happens in smart contracts, OK? So if you had worked with transfers like this, saying like, you know, the thing you're getting is a transfer and only operations on transfers can be applied, not just adding something to one, you know, ownership um, agent and the other, then you could, would have avoided a lot of errors, you know, where people basically had a, the problem that they were maintaining a balance that was supposed to be equal to the amount of ether they had in there and, and they get up, you know, it, it was off because, uh, the operations applied were not transfers. They were just, you know, sometimes unfortunate when, you know, transferring from A to B $50, what if A is equal to B? Okay, so you have to be careful because semantically here this means that's the zero transfer, okay. But if you're implementing this like with assignments, you should get it right, but still you have to be careful not to make sure that one of them gets added 50 and the other one is the same one really, um, you know, does not get deleted 50, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, somebody has more money than before. That's been exploited, by the way. So, um, and they have arbitrary report forms. I don't say this, but uh, think about it this way. 
you can now say these are low-level pieces of information. They could have individual transfers mentioned in there. We can then formulate actually report functions that aggregate information. So we get information about, um, you know, over the, sequ over the history of all the, the resource account, you know, the sequence of transactions, what has been the average transfer, you know, well, has there been, um, has there been, you know, what, what's the number of uh, people have been engaging in, in various transfers and all these things. So you can write functions just like you do in a functional setting. And very often, these functions, functions turn out to be, not always, they turn out to be linear maps on ownership types. And that means linear map has this wonderful distribution property, like f of o plus t is, you know, f of o plus f of t. That means that, hey, wait a minute. I can maintain the result of the report in real time. In the sense that any, I just have the result, and if a transfer comes in, I just update it by applying F to it and you know, adding to it. Um, and the resource manager um, implement whichever way resource management for arbitrary resource types. Um, so that's also quite noticeable. So it's, you know, if you use this calculus, this algebra of transfers, you can invite, invent, you can ask a resource manager, here we go, uh, you're a resource manager, you're doing this, uh, please maintain my account, uh, please maintain my currency, please maintain uh, uh, something that I'm trading with now, you know, I'm, I've just invented a little thing, you know, it's a bicycle of a certain kind, you know, please uh, keep track of ownership of those bicycles of that kind. And the resource manager doesn't even know, um, I, I don't know what these things are, but we'll do it correctly because it's just another resource type. Um, so the separation of credit limit policy and uh, which I indicated before gave us this kind of separation of having a wonderful algebra that is actually all the transfers they compose and then combining it with the nasty part which is the credit limit enforcement which means that the ownerships might, not all transfers might be legal uh, and we, we might get non-commutativity out of this one in the sense that, you know, they have to be done in a certain order or, as I mentioned, they might have to be by a user aggregated into a whole set of transfers or multi-set that then gets actually netted and submitted, which is the most general way of satisfying the credit limit of uh, policy of the resource manager. So what are events? Um, we've had events, so let's just see how we can extend this one to contracts. So, events are a set of events, so let's imagine we have lots of them, so a transfer looks like we have a transfer from Alice to Bob of, of some resource at some point in time. So, this would be one kind of events, okay? So, I think it was like, you know, any a agent, agent, resource, time, okay? And there could be lots of events, like business events and so on, I won't list them, okay? Um, but let's Im the first thing we need is basically we'll look at every event and say, does it have a resource effect or not? So uh, any kind of event, that's just any function from E to transfers. Having a resource effect means there is a resource transfer denoted, included in this uh, event. So the event could contain all kinds of information, but part of it is that it has a non-trivial resource um, uh, effect. So an example could be a function f effect that says take this kind of uh, um, event and say, oh, okay, that one has a resource effect. Namely, in this case, it's just, you know, Alice to Bob 30. It means like, you know, Alice is down minus 30, Bob is up 30, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll ignore time, okay? We, we, we could actually add discounting here and saying, you know, Maybe the effect of this one is actually scaled by the exponential under actually the time and the interest rate. If you want to do some kind of calculations like this, that you can determine by what f is, okay? But for now, uh, that's what f is, okay? But what we will actually then say is that if you have a sequence of events, we can extend such a function, any function f, and we will, by basically saying like a sequence of events that has happened, each one of them has a resource effect, which could be zero, but the collective effect of a sequence of, uh, of, of events is just the sum of each resource effect that it has, okay? In this fashion, every sequence of events is mapped through a given effect function 
to a single transfer, okay? And we have to be careful because depending on credit policy, these things might actually, you know, there might be some, some, some nasty uh, corners here, okay? But uh, let's just start here. Yes? Would the credit pol uh, policy be in this function? Or no, it's not. So in this function, actually, we'll just say the credit policy is in the resource manager. Okay, so for now, we're just saying, we're defining a way of saying somebody um, gives you a, you know, a sequence of events, and I'm asking you, please determine what the resource transfer effect of that sequence of events is. You'll ask, wait a minute, uh, can you give me an effect function, okay? And so here's the effect function, okay? If, and then just, you know, you give me a, a, a resource transfer back. What I'll do with that one is a second, is another story. I might submit it to a resource manager for validation and effecting or not, okay? But of course that's the intent. Yes, absolutely, and uh, I think I don't have it here, but a very conventional um, interpretation of this one is like, is, is I mentioned the prices, so you could say I'll compose the effect with a price function. The price function takes a high dimensional thing and maps it down, linear map, down to numbers, which is dollars, okay. And then you could say, oh, wait a minute, now I have a transfer what is the value in US dollars of that transfer to each individual uh, agent involved, okay? And we'll get back to this one next time, okay? Or maybe fourth time, yeah, uh, tomorrow. So what is a contract? So uh, a contract here, and it will make a difference to contract specification, that's just a set of event sequences. And I have this kind of ominous remark here um, about, uh, um, uh, whoa, I'm going the wrong direction. It's kind of strange. So this this extension works for arbitrary POM sets. You know, you, you probably you've you've had uh, uh, Alexandra uh, here, so so you probably heard about Pliny algebras and uh, and uh, the parallel serial um, POM sets. No, okay. Well, anyway, so POM set just means it's partially ordered multi set. So in the one extreme, a partially ordered multi set. Our sequences, those are POM sets where, you know, all the elements in it are totally ordered. That's, you know, that's the reason we get a sequence. Or if there's no order at all, that's just a multiset, okay? And then anything in between, which is a partial order, that's called a partially ordered multiset. But that's just a, a remark to indicate that in practice we won't insist on sequences eventually, but uh, loose, you know, just partially ordered uh, events. But for now, and here, Please assume these are sequences of events, okay, that we're dealing with. So a contract then is a, is a set of event sequences. So it's an element of the power set of E star, okay. So the finite sets, finite sequences of events. So here's an example of a, of a contract. So, you know, this contract is the extension of it. So it's, in this case, it's the, the set of all sequences, and, you know, consisting of either a a transfer from Alice to Bob of $30, and then followed by a transfer from Bob to Alice of one iPhone, where the first one happens at time t, and the second one happens type t prime, such that t is before Tuesday, uh, latest Tuesday, and t prime is at most one day after t. Okay. So if uh, t is on Sunday, then t prime is at the latest Monday. Okay. So that is a way of specifying a set of pairs, okay? Sequences of length two. We'll allow additionally, actually, the other order will say that, uh, oh, it could also be Bob. You know, so it's just the other order here. You know, Bob actually transferring to Alice the iPhone at T prime and then Alice uh, doing the other way in the $30, such that, you know, T prime has to happen by Tuesday. But then actually, uh, um, uh, um, Alice doesn't have to pay before eight days later. Okay, so this is an infinite, let's just agree, this is an infinite set of sequences of length two. The infinity comes from the t. Okay, there is, you know, there's an infinity of times t and t prime that satisfy this. Phone sale. So, 
what can we do with phone sales with contracts? We can do the following. We can say, look, you know, um, let's assume we have a contract, so some set of uh, sequences of events. We can uh, ask the question, are you terminated successfully? That means that is the empty sequence a member of you? So the empty sequence is like there's nothing else to do. You're done. So it's basically a way of how can I satisfy this contract? It's by doing nothing. And then you say, yeah, that's a successful uh, execution of the, of the contract. If you look a little bit disturbed, think of it as like this explaining the role of zero when you start with one, two, three as natural numbers, you find out you need a zero as a, as a, as a neutral element. Yes? So on the slide you've written equality. Uh, yes. So, but you said it's a value. So. Yes, and you're completely right, because what I was describing is possibly terminated. Oh, right. right. So there's a dis distinction. It's definitely terminated. If it's exactly epsilon, there's nothing else to do. It's done. But if epsilon occurs and other sequences, then it's it's, it means that uh, you know, there's m multiple ways of satisfying the contract. One of them is by saying, let's just stop. Thank you. Uh, so possibly terminated means that epsilon is at least in there, okay? So the empty string, the empty sequence. C is satisfiable if it's not empty. So think of it as like C being the empty set is like, please, parties in this one involved, please satisfy the empty set contract. And you would say, how is that possible? Whatever we do, the empty sequence, anything, nothing will satisfy the contract. So it's like, you know, think of it as like the, the breached contract or the uh, paradoxical contract, okay? And uh, E, an event E is valid for C. Uh, I should have done this in the other order. So let's look at this first. The residual contract of C under E, or the derivative sometimes called of C under E, is just the set of all suffixes S that start with E. Okay, so if you have all the sequences that are in C that start with an E. And for those, we take the suffixes. Who's heard of derivatives in language setting? Left derivative, like, you know, Brzezowski derivative? Right, so, so we'll recognize that uh, as a, a language derivative, okay? which it is. So uh, we'll say that E is acceptable for C if the derivative or the residual of, of C under E is not failed, so it's satisfiable. It's a way of saying, here's a contract. Some things have to happen. Let's try as the first thing E, OK? And you know, you'd say, like, wait a minute. You, you can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Because if I take the residual of E, that's the empty set. So clearly that's the first thing is you can't, you must satisfy, you know, the contract. So by starting with E, you've already shown that there's no way of completing it. That's invalid. It's, it's like it's, it's a bad event. You're trying to do something that's not making sense. So as I said here, so C expresses that remains to be done in a contract. So think of it as like, you know, C originally is what remains to be in the contract, but then we evolve it as we see more and more events happening as it always tells us what remains to be done. So the, uh, the residual here um, expresses what remains to be done after E has happened. And uh, supposedly after E has happened and we declared it to be or found out that it, it was a, a um, um, acceptable event. Okay, so uh, contract monitoring. So I'll, I'll do the rest uh, tomorrow, this one. But I'd like to start with a, um, a way of saying, okay, so, so we have, uh, just here's the things like, I've talked about contracts, but none of us has ever seen a contract yet. We'll see the next time. It's like, what we're doing right now is the equivalent of studying domain theory for a programming language theoretician, right? It's like, you know, what are my programs, okay? Eh, you know, let's first talk about algebraically complete, uh, you know, CPOs, you know. It's like, oh. and there's all these wonderful constructions on those. So it's basically, this is the domain of interpretation we have here, okay? Tomorrow we'll go back and say, are there things that denote these things, okay? And can we do the stuff here that we've seen here on the, in the syntactic domain, so algorithmically? But, but the key thing is that whichever way you specify, here's one way of having a program, 
and you might want to call that one in the blockchain setting a generic smart contract. Um, one of them that says, I'm generic in the sense that the first thing I do is I, some, I'm ready to receive contracts. So somebody passes to me a set of sequences or some way of denoting a set of sequences. Um, so then I launch a new process. Okay, new thread, but process it's completely separated. So um, and I'll initialize my uh, my residual contract to be the original contract that was passed. So it basically says like somebody has entered into a new contract, C zero, and they've asked me to monitor it. So um, what do I do? Upon receiving an event E, I'm the I'm the arbitrator basically for all the participants in the contract. So I'm receiving all the events. So on receiving an event E, what I do is, if E is validated, and by that I mean if E has a resource transfer effect, I'll check whether a resource manager has validated it. That's the first thing I do. If it's not, then I'll say, look, you know, um, you better make sure that the transfer in here really has happened. Because in this case, I'm not going to do it, OK? So if it's not the case, I'll reject it and say, go back. You know, it's like saying, like, oh, I've transferred $50. You know, Alice has transferred $30 to Bob. It's like, who's validated it? So is the resource manager that has said, yes, I have signed off on the transfer. It has happened, OK? If that's the case, then I'll continue. Then I'll say, OK, if E, if the residual of C under E is satisfiable, then I'll say, OK, that's a valid start for the rest of the contract. You know, so uh, you know, we can, from after this E, we can still continue and find some kind of completion of getting to the success of the contract. So I'll say it's accepted. And I'll update C. Now the current C is the residual contract. So I'm keeping track of what remains to be done after every event. Otherwise, I'll just return it. Reject it. It's not rejected. Yeah, no. It was uh, either wasn't validated or you know, it was not a, uh, an event that was acceptable. Okay, so it's a wrong event. So the, maybe the event was like transfer Alice to Bob, and somebody sent something to me that says Charlie is transferring something to Dave. So that's nothing to do with this contract. So that's not. I reject this event. It's not applicable to this contract because if I applied it. Formally, I would get the, f the empty set of residual um, events. And that's the definition of being unsatisfiable. Now, uh, I could also, uh, you know, people can also query me. Um, um, pu -pu -pu so people can also query me. So uh, we'll, uh, in that case, I'll just say this is the residual contract, you know. So, uh, what remains to be done. So all the parties here you know, are collaborating. They say, oh, wait a minute. I've lost track of what I've done. I've lost track of what other, everybody has done. What is the current state? So remember, this also means that the consensus on what the current state is, that's what the, this contract monitor actually expresses. This is the current state. I am the one who's making sure there is consensus on the state of a contract involving potentially many different agents. Now, and then uh, if I receive a terminate request, it says, um, you know, please terminate the contract. Um, it's quite unclear, actually. Well, you know, please terminate the contract. Then, then I'll check. Well, is C possibly terminated successfully? Okay. Then I'll say, okay, it can be terminated now. In that case, I'll say, yes, that's okay. Success. The contract is completed. You've done it all correctly, and I exit the process. It's done. If Otherwise, you know, somebody says, please terminate it. They're basically forcing me to terminate it um, and say, <laughs> epsilon is not in there, OK? So there's still things to be done. Uh, in that case, that's a breach of contract. It's not, term it's not done, OK? There's still things left, left to be done. And I'll breach with C. And I, I could continue, or I, in this case, I'll just write exit with the process. And I might return the C here and saying, you know, please whoever is actually handling this, you know, please handle what, what should happen now. It could be continuing then with, uh, with C. The key thing is like, you know, that's a breach and that's a success. Um, 
Now I'm out of time, but I'll show you the next time um, actually how to say like, wait a minute, there's all kinds of problems with this smart contract monitor. First of all, the great thing about it is it's not managing money, remember? It's just monitoring what's going on. It says, I'm not managing other people's resources, but the disadvantage is of course that what if we have a situation of the bicycle exchange we had before, the iPhone exchange, in the first place we get money from Bob, okay, and then after a while discover the times, times out, like it's Thursday now, um, then somebody says, you know, um, what's the state now? And then we'll find out at this time, actually the, uh, the, 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 you know, at this time there's no sequence of completing it, it's breached, okay. Then, you know, this one says, oh, in this case, the contract is breached, and here's the residual part of this, then do something with it, you know. But Bob is going to be very upset. Was it Alice who paid? I can't remember. Uh, he's very upset because he says, that's wonderful. There's this smart contract manager that said, uh, I'm carefully monitoring it. And then once things go wrong, it says, oh, things have gotten wrong. Good luck. Okay. Good luck. Oh, wow. Terrible. I know it feels terrible. Paying money for something and not getting it, right? Uh, so tomorrow we'll look at actually ways of trying to fix that. Okay. Thank you.